Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where in the uh, world you're joining us today. Uh, we're very glad that you could join us today in this uh, very relevant uh, seminar on the call for action to address the global food security uh, crisis. Um, today's seminar will really point to how the G20 can help uh, during crisis. And as the title says, this is a call for action so that we will really like to specifically um, include the food uh, security and malnutrition, um, framing it into the what it is the short term and also the long term. Um, um, this will be a very lively conversation about the uh, current situation and also some steps forward. So without um, um, following this, um, the way we will set it up this event will be um, first um, welcoming and an introduction from Yo Sweden, uh, who is the um, Managing Director of System Transformation from the CGIR and also the Director General of IFPRI. We will follow with um, also a presentation by Rob Boss, the Director of Markets, Trade and Institutions by IFPRI. And then we will have a discussion with our four panelists that I will uh, introduce shortly. But before uh, going to that, I would like to also hear, we would like to hear from you. So if you could participate in our Q&A session uh, that will follow the presenter's remarks, you can submit your questions on ifpre.org, on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on uh, Twitter. So with this, please uh, let me pass the floor to uh, Johan Sweden that he will do what can the G20 to address the global food security crisis. Thank you very much. Yo, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Valeria, and welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's uh, great to be here with you. I was in, in Bali at the G20 Ag Ministers meeting a week ago, and I'm so glad to uh, connect with you here today. Uh, I think we have a very timely IFPRI policy seminar, the call for action to address the global food security uh, crisis. Nothing can be more uh, timely, I think. Uh, we know that the global food systems are, are facing a perfect storm uh, of local global shocks driven by the three C's, COVID-19, conflict, climate change. Uh, last year, over 190 million people around the world experienced a food crisis or worse as conflict, natural disasters, and the economic fallout from the pandemic disrupted livelihoods and displaced communities. Even for families not in crisis, soaring food prices have made it more difficult for millions to afford a sufficient and a healthy diet. Recent analyses suggest that consumer prices for food in most countries have increased by 10, 20, 30, even 50 percent. And despite a recent fall in prices, markets in food, energy and other commodities remain tight. And this poses, of course, risk for their food security and nutrition security. High prices for fertilizer and extreme weather are threatening rural livelihoods, especially among smallholder farmers around the world. These events not only threaten immediate humanitarian or create immediate humanitarian challenges, but they also inhibit progress towards long-term goals for more sustainable, healthy and resilient food system. We know very much that human capital development is, is a crucial role in the long term for the livelihoods of people, for their integration, their inclusion in uh, a world that uh, gives them opportunities. Unfortunately, frequent and severe shocks are created by these three Cs, and this may be the new normal going forward. And the urgency of our situation, I think, today demands immediate and significant action. Um, so we have to address our uh, current needs, our current challenges, as well as the long-term needs and the long-term resilience of our system. There's been a number of promising actions that have been taken to mobilize and, and coordinate a global response. For example, there's been the declaration of the Leaders' Summit on Global Food Security recently, the Global Alliance for Food Security following the G7, and the Initiative for the International Food and Agricultural Resilience Mission. All of these have promised bold action and increased funding uh, to address these challenges. I also should also say that I'm, I'm proud of the work that my own organization, CIPRI and CGIR, have done over the past months to provide in years and decades even, but particularly now and, and most recently, to provide critical analysis and guidance for uh, policymakers as they design and, and implement their responses from the, from the local to the global level. 
Global challenges require a global response. And so that means that also that we need to have more coordination among these different initiatives uh, um, if we hope to make a, a truly um, large difference. Um, we Our research also shows that it is possible to do that, but it is only possible if we transition to a new system, if we make things different and radically different, if we do things radically different. As a coalition of large economies from around the world, the G20 has the power to guide current responses to the global food crisis. Uh, there's a number of things that we think that the G20 countries should do. One of them is coordinate and uh, to maintain open trade and stability in global food and fertilizer markets to prevent further uh, price volatilities in there and price spikes, obviously. Invest in agricultural extension and advisory services that improve farmer fertilizer use and the efficiency of fertilizer use and improve uh, soil health, uh, soil in, in more generally. Mobilize additional uh, humanitarian funding for those most in need. Provide fiscal support and relief to governments with high debt and limited financial uh, resources. Expand market intelligence and monitoring system to improve market efficiency. And an example that has come back many times also during the G20 meetings people have emphasized is the agriculture market information system. Uh, where the G20 already plays an important role in promoting market transparency and, and open trade. We should also ensure that policy responses are, are gender sensitive to account for the unique and the disproportionate impact that high food, uh, high food prices and, and the other Cs as well, climate change and COVID had on women, both as producers, consumers or uh, participants along the whole uh, value chain, I would say. Let me emphasize uh, three final points here. I think we need to address underinvestments in research and development and underuse of existing uh, innovations. Existing technological innovations, there are quite a lot there out there. They have great potential to reduce emissions, to adapt to climate change, to uh, reduce uh, food loss and waste, and also raise productivity and make food affordable. But the adoption of uh, technology is insufficient and requires a transformation of our current food system to reduce the constraints that people face in, in adopting them and give more better incentives for adoption. I think in the long run, uh, more research and development is needed for resilience and sustainability more generally. And so to achieve this, our analysis shows that we need to double public funding for R&D, including a very significant increase in developing countries. Another uh, important issue is to promote healthier diets and consumption of uh, sustainably produced foods. This should be a priority for uh, all uh, policymakers along in the food system, as sustainable diets can substantially reduce farmers and food systems ecological footprints. For a sustainable future, um, future, it is important that farmers and consumers, and in fact, all agents in the food system along the value chains, align around health and sustainability. And policymakers can play a crucial role by setting the right enabling environment, providing optimal regulations and policy uh, incentives. Finally, we need the transformation of our food finance architecture. We need that to uh, provide for innovative finance and better incentives for investments in resilient and sustainable systems. This requires a combination of different approaches and a transformation of public and private expenditure and finance systems. One element in this is the repurposing of the $700 billion of current agricultural support that is there already. And so we need to change this, to reform this, to provide incentives for farmers and, consu and consumers and to motivate them to produce and to consume in more sustainable, healthy and resilient ways. Our organizations, IFPRI and CGIR, are there to support the G20 and all uh, policymakers around the world by providing scientific evidence and technical guidance for this agenda and for, a system, a and for assisting a radical transformation of the world's agriculture and food systems. I will now um, end here and uh, try basically pass the floor to an excellent lineup of speakers who can provide more details on these policy recommendations, discuss them, provide their insights. We're very excited to have speakers from uh, several organizations here that have made critical contributions to the uh, crisis response. Uh, back to you, Valeria. 
Thank you so much, you for giving such a comprehensive uh, context uh, about uh, where we are and where we are heading. Um, I really like the, uh, the way you set it up in terms of first um, emphasizing the crisis, so the three Cs. And so it is not just uh, the current conflict, but but also uh, related with uh, with health uh, conflict and uh, and of course climate change, and how. It is um, the importance of really making sure that we are prepared for the long term so that we make sure that we have a resilient food uh, systems um, so that we are able to deal with not only the current crisis but future crisis. And of course, that all these initiatives and programs that have been uh, set it up and, and that we will discuss in more detail in this event, um, they need to be uh, a collaboration so that we need to make sure that it is global as well, so that we coordinate all these uh, global initiatives. Um, and also how these um, programs are the importance that they are based on making sure that uh, we have an open and multilateral trade, R&D, humanitarian help, the financial needs, and, and all the ones that you just mentioned. And again, that we will um, go into this detail. But also I really like uh, the, the thing you also set up these last three things in terms of that we need to make sure that the technologies that are available today they are also, we give the right incentives to producers to actually uh, adopt those new technologies. So it's not just a matter of creating the, the, the uh, invest in R&D, but also make sure that that, uh, that um, um, technologies are implemented by the farmers. Also the idea of healthier diets. Uh, I also like um, the way that now it is not only talking about food security, but also malnutrition, so that we're also including the healthier uh, diets and sustainable diets to make it even uh, more right. And then the part of the finance that we need to also look into the food systems and how we're going to give the right incentives for those investments, public, uh, private, and, and the repurposing of subsidies. Um, discussion that we're uh, having these these days but with this let me let me stop here and give the floor to rob boss the director of the markets and trade and institutions from from ifri thank you very much rob uh, thank you valeria and also yo for those introductory words that really sets the stage for the two questions that we would like to address at this seminar is the first is what can the g20 do to address the present crisis and make food systems resilient and sustainable to prevent any future catastrophe from happening. And secondly, uh, since as uh, Yo already mentioned, there are so many multiple international initiatives already there, should the G20 and can the G20 play a role to enhance, strengthen and coordinate the, those initiatives that are on the table? At the Bali Agriculture Ministerial meeting of last week, uh, the G20 members uh, already recognized that to say, put it in their own words, <clears throat> the critical food affordability situation calls for closer cooperation among G20 members to preserve market stability, avoid excess global volatility in food prices, and ensure global food systems resilience. G20 partners could commit to addressing global food insecurity and malnutrition aggravated by the war in Ukraine and reaffirming their determination to act concretely to respond to the major ongoing food crisis, focusing on its consequences for the most vulnerable." End of quote. Um, I emphasize the word could uh, in this uh, sentence, uh, but it's still um, something that's under consideration by these, uh, the G20 uh, leadership. At the same time, <clears throat> while this um, clear statement was there, um, at Bali, there was no agreed communique uh, achieved by the agricultural ministers, um, probably for uh, obvious political reasons, since it requires uh, consensus to get to an agreed communique. But they did agree to seek uh, beyond uh, uh, those words uh, to engage in uh, formulating more concrete joint action in consultation with the finance ministers and to do so in a joint agriculture, uh, finance and agriculture ministerial meeting of the G20 to be held next week uh, here in Washington, uh, D.C. 
Um, one thing that's standing out in preparation for um, that meeting is the recognition of the multiple initiatives that uh, Joe already referred to uh, and a desire to avoid duplication and coordinate across those initiatives. So I think something that we would hope to, the panel can also further address uh, how that could take place, uh, that coordination. Um, let me not repeat all of those uh, initiatives because Joe already uh, mentioned so those. I would add to that um, the initiative of um, the IFA, the International Fund for of Agriculture Development, to invest in more than 70 countries to build the resilience uh, of the world's poorest and most vulnerable uh, rural people. And the World Bank has also committed to uh, making 30 billion dollars available in new and existing funding for projects linked to food and nutrition security over uh, the next coming or this coming year. And the IMF is uh, uh, aiming to support countries affected by food insecurity through its extended uh, financing and contingency uh, lending uh, instruments. And is now also considering an additional new Food window, food shock window, as it's, uh, it's called, under its uh, emergency financing instruments. And then, lastly, the G20 finance ministers in a meeting in uh, July uh, also stated that they would consider all appropriate policy tools to address current economic and financial challenges, including the risk of food insecurity. So, those are great promises and uh, the question is uh, does anything serious could come out of this uh, in, in practice the track record of the g20 initiative on food security is not overwhelmingly great sometimes the agreements uh, that were made were ambitious but never properly funded or fully implemented and sometimes reality kept the agreements quite modest um, the best known agreement uh, the initiative created the agricultural market uh, information system, of which we also contribute as IFPRI, um, that's been proven to function well in terms of providing information, providing added transparency uh, to markets, but at the same time, certain aspects in terms of timely deliver uh, on data by the G20 members and other countries to aim is some things have been slow, uh, uh, no precise information is uh, provided on the size of grain reserves of uh, important uh, country. Um, so such that um, uh, the information system, uh, well, it's doing its job in the best way it can. It's not yet in a position to provide all the market transparency uh, it, uh, it needs. So this is uh, in a way a sobering lesson and a daunting uh, challenge moving forward. So. In general, the G20 commitments um, to work, um, they should get some teeth, uh, which means they must be in each country's uh, self-interest to, to work. So to make progress on this challenge, the discussion should focus on actions and language that even large and vulnerable and food insecure countries can sign on to in the belief that the world community will help stabilize food, fertilizer and energy markets and avoid panicked uh, actions. The collective games for an agreement to protect the global public commons, as we could call them, such as the resilience and stability of world food markets, uh, they are large, but they need to be clarified for all parties. The collective action is possible even without a binding enforcement mechanism, which uh, the G20 in the, way, in the end is an informal uh, setting of, uh, of the major economies of the world. But also, um, it's been shown, for instance, in the ASEAN, um, uh, um, the Association of Southeast and A Asian Nations, uh, after the uh, food price crisis uh, of uh, 2007, 2008, uh, they started to meet regularly to discuss national policies on food security and how changes in those policies might affect the world rice market, uh, important for, uh, for that region. Um, and the region was very heavily impacted by the 2008 rice panic when the world rice market spiraled out of control despite uh, globally adequate rice supplies. And the countries learned not to panic by talking through food security issues at ASEAN summit meetings held twice a year. 
And there's evidence that the policy uh, dialogue uh, worked to stabilize uh, uh, rice markets uh, for long periods uh, of time. So in the present context, uh, could the G20 uh, repeat uh, such fate and uh, on a much broader plane? So we should, should not just focus on the stability of international markets for staple foods, but also uh, particularly um, look at the threats of climate change uh, that are already affecting food security in many parts of the world, peace and security that's also influencing uh, the uh, sit uh, food security situation in many contexts. In fact, uh, those are the two key factors that uh, today's real food crisis uh, that we're facing today uh, and probably also will remain key factors in driving new food crisis risk uh, unless the world uh, addresses these uh, issues. Um, for um, next week's meeting, and uh, I also hope that in today's discussion we could dwell a bit further on these. Um, the G20 um, is recognizing first that uh, many initiatives are already uh, ongoing, that it uh, promises uh, or proposes to engage in a mapping exercise of those ongoing global policy responses, food security, um, and uh, uh, address and identify uh, uh, gaps in those responses and opportunities for further analysis to assist the G20 in navigating a crowded uh, policy space. It also wishes to build momentum for the G20 members' efforts to address the food security ahead of the G20 Leader Summit that also will be held in Bali. Um, and it also recognizes the importance not just to look at food security and food markets specifically, but also at the um, problems and the supply bottlenecks in uh, global fertilizer markets and high uh, fertilizer prices. And uh, in that context, it wishes to explore uh, immediate actions from the G20 members to address those uh, issues, as well as longer term uh, issues um, and consider even to have a more permanent G G20 finance agricultural uh, coordination uh, mechanism to accelerate the implementation of commitments and help address identified gaps. Um, more specifically, and uh, uh, several of the uh, uh, issues that Joe mentions in his introduction that uh, from, from our perspective, we think are important uh, to be addressed, that, that they're on the table, but uh, not yet with very specific action to be taken. So hopefully the panel can discuss these further. But there's uh, broadly in four realms. Uh, first are uh, financing measures. Um, uh, uh, there's been calls and uh, the G20s recognize that for timely and conditional uh, debt service uh, relief uh, for uh, low income uh, countries um, and uh, use uh, debt relief to be able to allocate more resources for urgent food related uh, expenditures, uh, including paying uh, import bills. Um, it's also considering discussing country level measures to provide urgently targets the temporary support to vulnerable households. Uh, it wishes to work uh, uh, with the international financial institutions, the World Bank, uh, IMF, and the multilateral development banks to explore options to provide necessary financial support and technical assistance to low income countries and other countries uh, facing uh, balance of payments constraints at the moment. And this could include strengthening existing financing me mechanisms, for instance, the 100 billion of budgetary support for countries most in need um, and uh, uh, additional uh, support to the World Food Program to uh, implement its uh, humanitarian and emergency relief. And even um, to uh, surprisingly, maybe since there's been long time discussions about this, but now it's also under consideration, the possibility of building on its uh, on support through uh, special drawing rights allocations. That's the uh, liquidity created uh, at the level of the uh, International Monetary Funds. And we allocate uh, some of the uh, underpins uh, uh, resources, the SDR resources, to uh, leverage additional capital for investment in sustainable food systems uh, uh, that could be uh, channeled through uh, the International 
the Fund for Agricultural Development, um, uh, IFAD. The second area is to focus on the more longer term issues on uh, agricultural food system intervention, uh, uh, including uh, investments in uh, fertilizer um, production uh, to address uh, existing uh, 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 supply bottlenecks and in enhance uh, local capacities for the uh, production of uh, sustainable uh, fertilizer and promotion of uh, more agricultural uh, practices uh, and reduce uh, in uh, some areas of the world also the dependency on uh, for the use of uh, fertilizer to enhance productivity. Investing in research and development uh, is uh, also uh, on the table, as well as in climate resilient, sustainable uh, agriculture, but only worded so far in very general terms. So I think we should discuss uh, how to make that concrete and actionable by uh, G20 uh, members uh, and uh, uh, other actors. Um, Particularly also particularly emphasis on uh, what assistance could be provided to developing countries in enhancing their capacity for uh, food production and through that uh, also uh, induce greater stability uh, of food prices in domestic and uh, international markets. The third area is, is on trade as a clear recognition um, that uh, um, uh, only by keeping food trade uh, open in the context of um, uh, what is called open, transparent and predictable uh, multilateral trading system. Uh, we can uh, use trade as a means to um, uh, enhance the stability uh, and, uh, and support food security uh, around the world. The question is that uh, since those calls have been done by the T20 uh, multiple times, including uh, after the uh, uh, the export restrictions taken by many countries uh, uh, during the uh, uh, lockdowns uh, during COVID, um, that since also with the uh, following the war in Ukraine, we've seen no restrictive export restrictive measures. Uh, so, is this call? For open system, is how can we make that effective and followed through by the G20? And lastly, um, uh, the G20 also wish, wishes to consider how could we further consider the medium and long term risk to food security and come to more uh, continuous and comprehensive systemic analysis of factors uh, affecting. Uh, food security. Uh, and uh, this is an area also where uh, at IFPRI, we're trying to look at not just how we can uh, identify the risk of the present crisis, uh, but be uh, forward looking and uh, have uh, early warning systems that can preempt uh, uh, future crisis. So this is quite an agenda on the table. Um, uh, on. Uh, from what I understand for a one hour meeting between the finance and agriculture ministers meeting uh, next week. Uh, so that's quite ambitious. Uh, will it be enough? That's the first question to the panel. Um, how can it build on the um, uh, existing uh, and ongoing initiatives and how can it be fall into place? And uh, can we uh, trust in, in the G20 to take uh, full leadership and push things uh, forward? So with that, um, I would like to hear from the panel and the further discussion uh, on this, and hopefully we can also push this forward to the deliberations uh, of the G20 agricultural finest ministers meeting uh, to be held next week. Thank you very much, Rob, and, and thanks for, for really uh, going into the answering the questions and the three questions that, uh, that we set it up, which is what can the G20 do? how we can make the food, the global food system more resilient and how to coordinate all these uh, initiatives. And of course, the importance of uh, policy dialogue if we really want to, to do something with this. So before I move to, the, um, to our panelists, I would like to remind you that you can ask uh, questions um, using um, uh, 
um, ifpre.org or Facebook or LinkedIn, YouTube, or ask ifpre uh, on Twitter. So please, uh, please put your questions there as we would love to have the opportunity to go through those uh, later in this uh, event. So with this, um, I would like to introduce you to our four panelists. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Godfrey Bahiwa. He is the Director of the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Development from the African Union uh, Commission. Um, in his role, he leads the efforts to develop and promote continental policies, frameworks, and programs that contribute to agricultural transformation and rural development in line with the African Union's agenda of 2063. We also have Dr. Arif Hussein. He's the Chief Economist and the Director of the United Nations World Food Programs Research. Uh, he does assessment monitoring uh, in the research assessment and monitoring division, sorry. His work focuses on analyzing food security and welfare conditions in developing countries to inform humanitarian response, uh, understanding linkages between poverty, hunger, conflict, and migration. We also have Dr. Damayanti Bukhari. Um, she is the chair of the T20 Task Force on Food Security and Sustainable Agriculture under the Indonesian presidency. Uh, some of her works relates to sustainable agricultural conservation, community empowerment, and environmental issues in Indonesia. And we also have Dr. Eugenio Diaz Bonilla. He is the special advisor of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, uh, IICA, and he's also a visiting fellow uh, here at IFPRI. He has experience as advisor to governments in different developing countries on macroeconomic and trade policies, poverty alleviation, and food security programs, and extensive involvement in project preparation, financing, and implementation in developing countries, mainly in agricultural and rural development operations. Uh, in this, and the web page, uh, IFPRI web page from this event, you can have the link so that you can really see all the um, more detailed CV. They have a, a, a lot, so I'd um, like to not jump into, take so much of the time for that. And with this, let me start um, asking a question to Dr. Bahiwa. Um, so who is Africa's populations are the hardest hit by the turmoil in global food and fertilizer markets. Yet with only South Africa being a member, the African continent is least represented in the G20. In the view of the African Union, what are three key areas for short and long-term international support that African nations need to address this crisis and build more resilient agricultural and food systems? And also, will the G20 be the best forum to lead and coordinate that support? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much uh, uh, for having the African Union join this uh, this uh, this panel. Um, as introduced, I'm Godfrey Bahikwa. I work with the African Union Commission, uh, and happy to join the other panelists as well. Yeah, so um, and I apologize for joining a little bit late. I was running from another another meeting, but I guess I joined when. Uh, uh, Rob was uh, perhaps in the middle or towards the tail end of his remarks, but I liked what he said. <clears throat> so um, for Africa, um, basically the, the starting point is uh, the, the, the various shocks that have um, hit our food systems. And in the recent um, uh, three, four years, we, had ha we have had like four shocks to our system. <clears throat> you recall the fall armor worm, that went to almost 48 uh, countries. Then the desert locust in the Horn of Africa. Um, then we have COVID-19. And now we have the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict on top of the, the climate change impacts. So quite a lot of, of, of shocks, one after the other, impacting Africa's food systems. And so our response uh, basically is to to say, what can we do to sustainably build resilient food systems in a meaningful manner? And every time there is a shock, we still talk. But really, the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has hit the has, has hit the continent so bad that um, I think people are saying finally we need to do uh, something very strongly to um, uh, address all the key uh, constraints to agricultural production on this continent. 
And so uh, in line with the thinking that uh, I had from Rob, uh, we have five priorities and I will be very brief around them and then come direct answer to your question around the role of the G20. So the first thing that we uh, think about is boosting food production. We have to raise the quantity of food that is produced in Africa. No doubt about that. Um, and of course, to do that, seed systems development is, 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 is one of the sub priorities. Um, fertilizer production and consumption on the continent, worrying about soil health, because the, maximizing the benefits of fertilizers, you have to worry about the, the quality of soil. And of course, uh, water management as well, especially for uh, looking at small scale irrigation. So those are some of the priorities that we have and up boosting food production. The second priority is um, post-harvest food loss uh, management. As you know, uh, 30 to 40% of some of the food produce is lost on the continent. And so aspects to do with, you know, investing in infrastructure uh, for post-harvest food management, uh, cold storage, agro-processing, and so on are part of um, uh, uh, post-harvest food loss management. The third, and I will not elaborate on, on this because Rob did a good job, and this is boosting trade, especially in Africa trade. Uh, on the continent for agricultural uh, products. But to be able to do this, we have to have the right policy reforms or the right policies in place, removing trade barriers, both tariff and non-tariff, and especially non-tariff barriers to trade across the continent. And of course, addressing food, uh, food safety. The fifth is climate smart agriculture, and especially um, investing in agricultural research and development that produces uh, technologies that are resilient to climate change and the last one, but not least, uh, is around the mutual accountability to, uh, towards actions and results. It's one thing to commit, uh, it's another to actually implement and hold each other accountable to uh, the results that we want. So those are the key five priorities in the summary that we are uh, pursuing. Now, coming to the, to the G20, yes, um, I think in my mind, every forum now, <laughs> or every platform that can help uh, take action. Because for me, the call is around action. All these areas I have elaborated, um, it is about taking action in each of these areas. Whether you are talking about the G7, you are talking about the G20, or G the, the G77, the, the, the whichever platform you are talking about, for me, the call is the same. What can we do as the international community working with our African Union member states to do this, the five things that I talked about in addition to what Rob had earlier stated. And some of these um, are as simple as supporting a country have um, a national agriculture investment plan that is evidence-based to which uh, national resources can be allocated. And if insufficient, then look for external resources. As simple as having a credible planning instrument. Second is around um, transfer of technologies, proven technologies from uh, the uh, countries that have uh, invested in research systems that, that work to, um, to the developing countries. And um, we are beginning to see African countries start to open up. Um, five, 10 years ago, if you talked about GMOs, you probably would be kicked out of a room. Um, three days ago, I saw the, the Republic of Kenya actually saying, we are now open to using GMO technologies. So technology transfer is another now avenue to explore with, with our member states. And finally, before I yield back the floor, um, the whole thing around financing. These, all these priorities that we're talking about across our 55 member states cost money. And as you have known, the, the various shocks that I, I mentioned earlier, all have hit our economies hard. Uh, fiscal revenues are, are down. The economies are not performing as good as they are. Countries have resorted to borrowing. And so even the proposals to um, the intervention that we want to invest in to uh, build the food resilient systems are going to be costly and resources are scarce. And we're also worried about the debt trap that our countries may find themselves in if we are not careful. So resources are needed, but at the same time, we don't want countries to to, to, to increase the level of, of debt. So these are some of the messages I would say 
that should go to uh, to the G20 platform um, uh, when the, the 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 time is right in terms of, of messaging and um, communicating to uh, that platform. I will be back to you, and I would be happy to respond to any specific questions that uh, may be posed to me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ohiwa, and uh, for also bringing the, the message of take action and be uh, accountable. And with this, um, let me move to uh, Dr. Tori. Um, so my question is the T20 task force that you had came up with several uh, proposals for consideration by the G20 leaders that will address both the short term uh, needs to alleviate food security impacts of the present crisis and address also long term food system challenges. So could you briefly explain what the main ask is to the G20 and also how do you envision going forward? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for <laughs> this invitation. Uh, in the task force, um, the main recommendation that came out from, um, from our task force for the G20 is the umbrella about um, how important it is to create a sustainable and resilient agriculture food system. Um, by focusing on financing, source diversification, increasing affordability of healthy diets, and also enhancements of the food supply chain. So more or less, um, Rob has also uh, stressed on that. And um, we have five uh, main um, recommendations. And the first is on financing. And this is actually to address the, um, I would say the, um, global crisis right now from the political uh, situation because of the Russian and uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, conflict. So uh, on the financing, uh, we put down that it is very important that there's a speedy mobilization of financial resources to address this humanitarian crisis, particularly in the low and middle income countries. So this should be the top priority for the, for the G20. That's the first one on the financing. Uh, the second one on addressing food and nutrition insecurity by diversification of the food sources, supply and output markets through diversifying production, producing more nutritious food and shifting away from protectionism. Um, in our task force, we really stress also on, on nutrition because when we discuss about food system, usually uh, nutrition is something that uh, people tend to forget. So in, in this uh, communique, we really stressed uh, uh, also about the, the not only food insecurity, but also nutrition insecurity. And the recommendation for the G20 is that G20 should invest in innovation, in food diversification, and reiterate its calls on countries to refrain from imposing restriction on the food and fertilizer trade. Um, so this is also uh, related to the um, current crisis. Um, and also uh, G20 should provide leadership within the WTO to reinvigorate agricultural trade negotiations. Um, so that's the second one. And then the third one is about affordability, increasing affordability of healthy diets by encouraging investment into local, national, regional, and global um, supply chain infrastructure. Um, so we believe the interconnectedness between local, national, regional, and global uh, supply chain. And again, in this uh, situation where we see a uh, disruption in the global, uh, global supply chain, maybe the local and the national and the regional will become, uh, will, will make, uh, play a ma major role in this short term uh, situation. Um, so our recommendation for the G20 is that the G20 should play a role in enhancing the public and private investment in infrastructure to produce, distribute, trade and market nutritious food, which tend to be more per perishable and that the G20 should build on the global efforts to ensure that the food system focus on the production, 
distribution and marketing, uh, and also enhancing the capacity and resources of sustainable business models. Um, the fourth is on enhancing the agri food supply chain through integration into the global value chain. And this is where we, um, this is a cross cutting with a, with a trade uh, task force. So um, some of our recommendation is not just from the food, uh, uh, from the task force number four on food security, but also it is a collaboration with the task force on trade and also task force on the climate. And this one is a, a cross cutting with the task force on trade. And um, the recommendation is that the G20 should support agriculture policy that encourage nature positive production, such as uh, protecting natural system from new conversion for food production, sustainability managing existing food production systems, and restoring degraded farmland. And so uh, G20 should anchor supply chain in an effective regulatory environment, recognize and small protect the small farmers. Uh, small fisheries and um, ensure investment and upgrading, um, particularly aquaculture fishery supply chain. So there's um, a stress also on the um, fishery supply chain that usually are being left out. Um, the final one, the fifth one, is on the enhancing food production on the basis of environmentally friendly and sustainable agriculture practices. So this is a cross-cutting with the task force number three on climate, uh, climate crisis, climate change. Um, the recommendations that the G20 should push forward with the highest priority uh, for making agriculture and food systems sustainable and climate resilient. So in support of this agenda, the G20 should promote the circular economy, reduce food loss and food waste, establish framework for sustainable production and consumption, and make resources available for research and development to facilitate innovation. And thus, the G20 should ensure that the food system transformation will contribute to reducing inequality, create investment, particularly in rural economy, create jobs, and also support rural transformation through supporting small scale farmers family farming, women and local communities and involving youth in agriculture. Um, the G20 should promote the mobilization of innovative financial resources to facilitate uh, even-handed participation of low and mi middle income countries in the sustainable transformation of agriculture and food system. So that's our uh, five recommendations for the G20. And now how to move this forward. Okay, first of all, I think I would like to reiterate the, um, the first president of Indonesia, um, Sukarno. Um, he always stressed that food is about life and death. So I think we need to think in that term. We need to have a, a common agenda that we need to agree that yes, food is about life and death. Okay, and, especially, and this is especially true for low and poor income communities. So um, food is not just about trade, it's about future civilization. It's about future global stability. So food is the foundation for facing the global crisis and thus global transformation that is needed. So I think this is very important if we can uh, agree on this. And then the second one, how to move this forward? Well, I think at the moment, Indonesia has a very difficult task. Um, and in the communique, it is written that one of the key, um, the key point of how uh, the G20 can actually work together is global cooperation. So one of the message from the communique is global cooperation is key. So, I think I would like to reiterate this again uh, tonight or today, this morning. Um, Indonesia has the presidency at the most difficult situation after the COVID and then the political landscape, uncertainty. There's so much uncertainty right now. So we need global cooperation. And I think we've all seen how the president of Indonesia has traveled to different countries to negotiate and to make 
people come together, uh, able to sit together and make this global cooperation work. Now, the question is, do we want to? Can we shed these differences? So if we believe that food is about life and death, food security should be decoupled from the global political situation because it's about life and death. So financing for food security is key, avoid protectionism, develop food system that is resilient, especially at the local level becomes very important. Strengthen the uh, small scale farmers, global cooperation is key. So um, I think with that, I would like to uh, end uh, my um, comment right now and give this back to Valeria, thank you. Thank you so much to Corey uh, for bringing up um, and the, the importance of having a common agenda, but that we also all have to agree on, and also the need for global cooperation, if that's our goal as, a, as um, for, again, from, from the global community. So thank you very much. And with this, uh, let me um, now ask a question to um, Mr. Hussein. Um, so in a concept note for the Joint Agricultural and Finance Ministers meeting, as part of immediate actions, there is a call for enhancing financial and in-kind contributions to the World Food Program, as well as to increase ODA, um, official development assistance, no? for humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable countries with food insecurity and nutrition challenges. This may alleviate immediate needs, but isn't this too late? Uh, or too little for people in the Horn of Africa and in other food crisis countries? And also, um, my second question is, what will you ask for the G20 to make sure more resources for humanitarian relief will be aligned with long-term actions that will help prevent future global shocks leading to new food crisis? So again, short-term and long-term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. I'm really <clears throat> happy to be here. Uh, although the, the, the topic is quite sobering. Um, let me just say, start with the, the too little, too late. I think that too little, too late we saw in 2011, and that was in Somalia. Uh, and the cost was um, 260,000 people dead, half of them before even a famine was declared, and half of them women and children. That's a lesson from from history and since then i think everybody has been you know making sure or trying to make sure that we are not too little and too late um i was doing this comparison between what happened in 2011 and what is happening now if you stick with somali region um in 2011 it was two consecutive drought failures uh, or failures droughts uh, it was about 3 million people who were in IPC4+, plus integrated phase classification, people in, in crisis or worst level of hunger. Um, there was lesser insecurity then. And by July, when famine was declared, 260,000 people or half of them were already dead. This time around, when you look at the magnitude of the problem, you see that uh, this is already four consecutive seasonal failures. Almost 7 million people in crisis or worse, worse insecurity situation. And we are sitting in September, October. Um, and we are not seeing that type of mortality that we saw in 2011. Why? Why? Because governments and people have been generous in terms of donating. WFP alone has been assisting upwards of 5 million people each and every month. And um, that is keeping people alive, at least in places where we have access. Now, the trouble with all of this is that we are literally one step ahead. Right? And then we are looking at the fifth route. And the other trouble is that we don't know in places where we don't have access, we don't know what's happening. So when we go there and pick up the lead, we don't know what we will find. 
But where we have access and when we have resources, we have been able to avert famines. Uh, we saw the same thing in 2017 and now. So not really too little, too late. In fact, um, governments in particular, the US has shown extremely leadership on this side. Uh, always our biggest donor, but after Ukraine, um, even bigger. We are at record levels of resources received, upwards of 12 billion right now. But the pain is that the needs continue to increase. So we still have a gap of about 50% with record amount of money. That's our, our reality on the, on, on the ground. And I'm using just one country as an example, but this plays across countries. I think on the, on the positive side, what people are realizing, what we are realizing is that hunger, uh, sorry, humanitarian and development, um, they're not either or propositions. It is becoming more and more about humanitarian and development. And to give you the proof of that, if you look at IFI is our biggest one in Washington, World Bank, as well as IMF, uh, World Bank came up with the FCV strategy, fragility conflict, violence strategy in 2020. IMF followed suit in 2022, this year in April, they came up with FCV. And I read that as a recognition that if you're gonna do development, you need to have right enabling conditions, you need to have stability, you need to have uh, peace, basically. We at World Food Program as the largest humanitarian agency also realize the same thing, that if we just do humanitarian, it's not gonna work. We need those partners. So it is a bridge. So people are coming together. And the proof of people coming together is not, not only World Bank and I'm providing a lot more financing to, to World Food Program, but also in the joint statements. Uh, joint statements between IMF, World Bank, WTO, and World Food Program, the first one. And then the second one also including FAO. So the good news is that it is happening at the international level. There is this coordination, but above all, there is the recognition that we need this. And another thing which is positive is uh, from WTO exemption of uh, uh, humanitarian commodities for World Food Program from export bans. It took years to get it done, but it is done. So that's another something which which I see as a as a big positive. Now coming to to G20, I mean they they also sit on all these boards, no? So I mean there are things happening. It needs to happen more. It needs to be seen on the ground. And that is where we need to get to. Now, one thing I like to say is that, look, if you want to, you know, many times people say, okay, you know what, why, you know, when will the humanitarian needs come down? You know, in our 82 countries, we got 345 million people in crisis or worse situation. We got 50 million people in, emergency or worse situation in 45 countries. So one question people ask, when are these needs going to come down? And my answer is simply that when we address the root causes, if there was conflict today and we were assisting somebody because of that conflict and that conflict stays tomorrow as well, why should the need come down? That, that thing is still there, right? So if we want to bring the humanitarian bill down, then we need to deal with the root causes. And the, you know, a good start is the three C's. You know, when we start to believe in numbers and look at our numbers, right now, forcibly displaced people, more than 100 million. And many of them, 
majority now is because of climate. So if we're not sorting these out, I mean, look at the floods in Pakistan, a country of 220 million people, one third of that flooded, $30 billion already gone in damages. So these are real things. And we need to make sure that while we are talking about keeping people alive, we also need to make sure that we are investing, we are doing something to deal with what has put them in that stage to begin with. I mean, you know, hunger and poverty, these are outcomes. They happen because something did not go right, particularly hunger. So if you're going to be focusing, let's focus on what didn't go right. And I think this is what GA20 needs to see. And now just, just bringing this uh, to today, we look around in the world and what we are seeing is that you got high inflation, food inflation. Uh, I think at last count, there were about 60 countries with upwards of 15% year on year food inflation. Um, you have, you know, people said, oh, you know, food prices have come down. Well, food prices have come down to what? A 10 year high for food and a seven year high for fuel pre-war in Ukraine. And let's also talk about the strength of the dollar. You know, in 2008, food and fuel prices, dollar to euro was 148, 1.48. Today, dollar is stronger than euro. So when these commodities, whether it's food, fuel, or fertilizer, which are traded in dollars, one, the prices are at 10 year and seven year pre-war highs, but the strength of the dollar makes it even more expensive. For whom? For countries which are already debt led. I mean, if you again believe our numbers, we are saying that there are 60% of low income countries right now are in debt distress or high risk of debt distress. IMF just came out basically saying that for these 48 plus countries, the import bill for food and fertilizer for 22, 23 is going to be $9 billion. And it is consequences for people will cost another $7 billion. This is IMF. So what I'm trying to point out is that these are, these are the real things which we are seeing out there. Uh, and, and there are very solid explanations. And people are at least agreeing on the problem statement. Now, I don't want to, I mean, the recommendations which all the panelists have mentioned, I think they're, they're, they're fair, they're straight, uh, they make sense. But one thing which must happen is that are these recommendations driven from because we are in a shock or people are actually seeing that as things which need to be sorted out because the solutions, they take more than a week, a month, a year. And what we have seen back in 2008, again in 2011, some of the problems we are talking about today existed even then, but nothing was done. So can we have it and it's something different and when this shock goes away and hopefully soon, we do stick with it and we do sort out some of these problems. I think if we can do that, that will go a long way come next time we are in a bind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arif, for for um, for your comments. And I would just like to highlight the uh, challenges that you mentioned, which they are access, the gap in the funding that uh, it is today, and it will keep uh, doing the same unless we do something about it. Um, then to deal with uh, the root causes of the problems, and and lastly, these I, I really like the the way you put it together the humanitarian and development that they have uh, to go together and that how you related that with uh, the two big positives that you see which is to be in that bridge recognized 
and then that in the last uh, ministerial conference from the World Trade Organization, how they dealt finally with death for restrictions for, for the WFP uh, programs. So uh, thank you very much for that. And now uh, let me move to uh, Eugenio. So Eugenio, the um, concept note for next week's Joint Finance and Agricultural Ministerial meeting includes a proposal. Uh, the G20 members work with the international financial institutions, the um, IFIS, members to explore options to provide necessary financial support and technical assistance to low-income countries and other countries in need by strengthening existing and exploring new financing mechanisms. So for example, the $100 billion of budgetary support for countries most in need, G20 leaders committed at the G20 Rome Summit in 2022, the beginning of this year, and assess the possibility of the special drawing rights, the SDRs, uh, reallocations to leverage additional capital administered by IFAD uh, for investment in sustainable food systems. So how significant do you think these 100 billion budgetary support um, vis-a-vis -vis short term needs? And then the second question is, how likely is the SDR proposal to get enough support? Thank you very much, Eugenio. Uh, thank you very much, Valeria. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to share with um, the previous panelists this discussion. I have um, five points and then perhaps a six and a seven if, if I have time. First point, what is the problem? Second, how much does it cost to solve it? Third, where the financing may come from? Fourth, specifically the international development funds and the proposals related to that. Then a fifth, a comment related to macro and developmental strategies and how we need to put it in a larger framework. Then sixth, a point of messaging. What a, uh, I remember a poster in the US who said something to me, very, very, very important, which is, is not what you say, it's what people hear. So what are we, uh, what is the message that we are putting out? And finally, some comments about the mapping exercise and some, uh, and the uh, alliance, the Continental Alliance for Food Security that the ICA called at the uh, Summit of the Americas in, in Los Angeles in June. Okay, problem. <laughs> uh, Yes, food security, but food security is part, food and nutrition security is part of the transformation of food systems. So if we are going to focus only on food and nutrition security, what exactly is the indicator that we are going to use? We have 770, seven, about 800 million of undernourished. That's hunger, that's calories. Or if we look at severely um, insecure, that's related to more a subjective and a questionnaire in depending on how you answer that more subjective questionnaire, then you get to the severe. That's about 930 million people, 12% of the global population. If we put together severe and moderate, we have 2.4 billion people, about 30% of the population. And so we have a calories indicator, we have a, a experiential indicator, and if we go to income indicator, uh, let's take the 3.65 new line, poverty line, there is no for 2020, 21, but 2019 it was about 1.8 million billion people, 23 percent. And if we look at healthy diets, uh, which is closer to the intermediate poverty line that the World Bank calculates, that's about 42 percent. So, what is the problem in terms of people? What are we gonna? What is the the problem that we want to solve? Uh, that's if we look at individuals. But then you, we need to look at the other aspect that was mentioned too is uh, countries no we have a balance of payment gap uh we have a and are we looking at the debt the short-term debt uh, the private debt uh and we have a fiscal gap so uh, we are looking at, at the at the budgets so exactly what is the problem that we want to solve and the, the paper that arif was referring to the world the imf just came out uh, a few days ago looks at the balance of payment gap and the fiscal gap and the calorie gap okay so we need to be clear about what the problem is because then that's my second point that defines the cost no if if we are looking only um at undernourishment uh, then we uh, i uh, summarized uh, the studies that if pre 
and the International Institute for Sustainable Development and Cornell did, Valeria, you were part of that. Uh, the, the work that the Center for uh, Development Research at Bonn uh, University with FAO. So it depends, uh, they, they have different costs for different type of targets. Um, around, uh, and the IMF, for instance, is considering only the 48 countries that uh, Aris was referring to, and they calculate um, $50 billion additional dollars just for the, the calorie, the calorie gap. But that's the, that's the undernourishment, and we picked only one of the various several uh, objectives that I defined before. Um, then if we go to the balance of payment, if we want to look at the short-term debt for all developing countries, that's about uh, $2.6 trillion. Uh, if we look on uh, short-term plus private, if we look at only short-term uh, for low-income countries only, uh, that's about 340 million. So we did, we have, that's the debt. But then the IMF calculates the gap. What is the gap? Cal uh, because of the increase in, in cereals and fertilizer. That uh, gives the numbers that uh, Arif was referring, 9 billion for these 48 countries only. And if you go to the fiscal gap, uh, that's about 5 to 7 billion uh, calculated by the, by the IMF. So, First, what is the problem? Then what is the cost is related to the problem. Then we move to the third point, which is where the money may come from. The G20 is looking mostly at the, in, what, uh, in the papers, several papers that we've done with Johan, with Rob, uh, Ruben Echevarria, et cetera. We distinguish several uh, flow of funds or sources of funds, and international development funds is only one. Then you have budgets, then you have banking system, and you have capital markets. So, and, and each one of those may uh, require different type of interventions if we want to mobilize. Uh, for instance, in, in the case of budgets, Rob uh, referred to the repurposing of agricultural subsidies, but then we have fossil fuel subsidies and we have different type of taxes. So we need a, a extensive or comprehensive tax and expenditure review of the whole budget and, and how this uh, allocation of money is related or not to the objectives that we define. Maybe just food system, uh, sorry, food security and nutrition, or food system transformation would be even uh, more expensive. Um, and then in the papers that I mentioned, we had a, a paper uh, with Rob uh, for the D20. We discussed uh, different additional um, interventions to guide the, the, the budget, the banking system, and, and capital markets. Four, um, I mean, looking only at the international development funds now. Okay, $100 billion for budgetary support. Is that additional separate uh, replaces the $100 billion that are related to uh, climate change or not? Uh, because, um, and some of the, the for instance, the, uh, the $30 billion that the World Bank um, off, uh, offer for this financing, there is an overall financial envelope. The World Bank has certain sustainable lending limits, like the IDB, the African Development Bank. And if I allocate part of that money to this, means that there is less money to some other things. So the main question is how we optimize the level of use of the capital base. Now the leverage is only around 2.7 for all the MDBs. The World Bank may have closer to four, five. So the amount of um, development loans that you can provide with your capital base, uh, that's about, uh, in overall, 2.7. That's the ratio. So you, for every dollar of capital, you can have 2.7 dollars of, uh, of loans. The World Bank may be closer to four or, or up. The IDB around three to four. But IFAD, for instance, it's a fund. So it's one, one. Now, only now, June 2022, they issue the first bond. They are transforming into a bank and then they, will, they can have some leverage. But IFAD is, at the lending of IFAD, if you can, everything, the money from IFAD, co-financing and, and the uh, counterpart, that's about 3 billion a, a year. So um, we need to look at all these aspects of optimizing the use of the money in the multilateral development banks that now, in my view, they are following very restrictive uh, financial policies 
that doesn't allow a larger uh, expansion of lending. SDRs, I'm still within the international development. The SDRs, you have a lot of legal and political problems. Now, the SDRs, the US, we are talking about $824 billion in, uh, in US dollars of the SDRs, the holdings. Of that, about 500 billion are in the hands of developing countries. And 362 is as US, UK, Germany, France, Japan, and Canada. Okay, we can, we can use this far better than giving to countries that do not need it. Okay, but politically in the US, they need the approval from Senate and there is a senator that is blocking the use. In other countries, the, 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 the European Union has some rules about what can you do with the SDRs. Um, and, and there are legal aspects because that's money, that's a reserve asset for central banks. So the different central banks may have different rules about how to trade to treat those, those assets. In any case, there are far better uses than the one to one. If I give one SDR to IFA, it's just one. If I give it to the World Bank for a capital base, maybe then the leverage may be four. Uh, but it, this proposal that we have, um, I, I presented it in a paper for the scientific group. We wrote something with Joaquin von Brown. If we use the SDRs as a guarantee fund to uh, each to support developing countries that have a plan to issue uh, perpetual bonds, meaning or very long dated bonds, maybe a hundred year bond, but perpetual, I think it'd be easier to, to calculate. Uh, then you can use the SDRs to find to uh, guarantee the stream of payment of the interest. So the leverage may be four to seven times the money that you are um, um, that, that you are allocating in this uh, guarantee fund. Uh, my five, fifth point, and probably I'm not going to get to the six and the seven. You will already cut me when 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 I'm off. Um, macroeconomic theory and development theory. We need we need to look. Um, you know, Latin America, uh, Middle East, and Northern Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at the, the econometric analysis, I have some um, reviews in, in, the, in the book that IFPRI uh, 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 edited or rather uh, published. Um, it, it can be downloaded freely. Uh, these areas, the growth rate is correlated positively with the level of prices of commodities, which by the way, move together many times. It's not only food. Is food, energy, and minerals, and 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 you look. They all these areas were growing from 2000 to 2011, and then they be, uh, they declined significantly. The growth rate close to 0 0.4, 0 0.7 in per capita. So the the commodity cycle is also related to the growth cycle. So we need to consider that, and also the macroeconomic aspects because volatility doesn't come necessarily yes it comes from from um from climate uh, shocks but it's also from macroeconomic uh, aspects so we had a, a very expansionary monetary and fiscal policy that during some period and then if we have a very contractionary policy then we will have a lot of volatility and that's absolutely unrelated to uh to these conditions on, on on food production um i i think i'll leave it I have two more points, but I think I'm I'm way above my my time. Thank you, thank you so much, Eugenio. And uh, and yes, um, we, we're running out of time, and uh, we have very good um, questions in the uh, in the chat. So I would just like to to mention um, and combine and some, and maybe leave uh, just uh, one of the panelists if we can just address uh, these questions. So I'm. Um, um, Temeskan Wedafo from the National Soil Testing Center in Addis um, Ababa says, is policy, alone, uh, sorry, is policy alone enough to address the global food crisis? And then we have two more questions that maybe they can, we can relay them. And one comes from um, Sadar Uddin Siddiqui uh, from Pakistan. How do you manage a food security program which is disrupted by non-cyclic uh, climate change, drought and flood? And then another question from um, Sadar um, 
from, from him as well. Uh, you propose to produce more food. How is it possible in climate change scenario, lack of technology and resources? So, so these are uh, two of the questions. So could it be uh, possible um, if one of the panelists would just like to address some of these uh, points? Thank you. I think I would like to <clears throat> to try the um, the first one. Is policy enough? Yeah. Um, no, policy is not enough. Policy is key. Policy is the start. But as mentioned earlier by was it Godfrey, action. We need action. So we need global cooperation. We need uh, global action together. And then also, of course, the um, the technology and uh, the finance. So policy is, is the start, but um, action and implementing on the ground is, is key. I think that's my short answer for that first question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samayanti. Is there anyone that would like to um, uh, answer or have a say in this? Thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I mean, what surprises me is that uh, the world doesn't have a shortage of food. I mean, you know, we do produce a lot of food. Uh, in fact, we produce so much that we are able to waste about 30% of that at different stages and then feed pretty much every, everybody around. So, so it, is, it, is, uh, it is not a production problem. It is, it is what happens, you know, the efficiencies in terms of production and then after it is produced, what happens and how it is wasted and where it goes. Uh, those are issues which, uh, you know, uh, I like to say, I've been, you know, talking to young people and saying, you know, maybe we should have something like buy less, buy often uh, to reduce food waste because we all do it. Um, I think that's, that's one thing. Having said that, this is when we start looking at climate and shifts in climate and changes in climate, um, that is, that is something which is all about basically how you're going to adapt to that so so for me i mean you know the first thing is the recognition that yes it is a problem yes it has been uh, with us for quite some time and now that agreement of the problem statement takes you to the next step so somebody asked me about cop 27 in cairo i was just in cairo to say you know what, what what's your expectation of cop 27 i said well you know what you got the agreement on the problem statement, everybody's getting together. Now let's get some agreement on action. What are we going to actually do about it? And then make it actually happen. Because back to the policy question, you can write whatever you want on a piece of paper, but unless you turn that into concrete action, which happens, and not just for one day, but over time, uh, things don't change. So uh, for me, I mean, Pakistan is a very, very good example of how devastating it could be and what is its impact also on markets. I mean, don't forget, Pakistan is the fourth largest producer of rice in a 220 million people country. So if a net exporter turns into a major importer on a commodity like rice with all the fertilizer issues which are going on, I don't think that works very well just looking back in 2008. So we need to be talking about these things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arif, and for bringing up the the, the case of uh, rice that we will also um, need to include also export restrictions on rice no, done uh, by India as well. So that is definitely a discussion. Um, well, I would like to thank you um, very much all the panelists, but before we close this event, I would like to give the floor to uh, Rob Boss to give it some concluding remarks. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Valeria, and uh, thanks uh, to all the panelists. Uh, well, we've we've heard, uh, yeah, a lot of I think good ideas um, that align pretty well, I think, with uh, the key points on the agenda for the joint uh, finance and agriculture ministerial meeting. The key question we put in place, and also what came up from the uh, Q and A uh, questions that were um, uh, put forward, is okay. How do we get to to real action uh, on the ground and what role can then the G20 to push forward to it. Um, 
as I said in my my uh, initial remarks, um, key for G20 is first to find common ground um, agreement on what global commons it wants it wants to address and can address. And we've heard uh, uh, not just the need for um, more global um, cooperation that that's important, but it's also the exist existentialist needs. What as uh, Dami Bukori was, was saying, uh, quoting Sukarno, that uh, food is about life and death. Uh, so it's an existentialist threat and climate change uh, goes in the same uh, direction. So uh, the question is, is that is this now a momentum that the G20 really can step to uh, the plate and, uh, and make, make a change? And uh, um, well, we can only hope it will do and that it will sustain. And that's uh, another key question. In my experience uh, looking at and following the G20 process with the 2008-2009 uh, the financial crisis, the G20 actually did step forward to the plate with a joint action plan in 2008 at the Pittsburgh summit and followed through the London summit. Um, but then a year later, it all fell apart because all countries wanted to push in different uh, directions, uh, some for more fiscal stimulus and others fiscal restraint. And uh, yeah, the sense of coming together uh, fell apart uh, after uh, basically also the worst of the crisis seemed to be over. Um, and of course, it, it took um, a much longer period of time to recover from it. So we don't want to end up in the situation like uh, like that. And that, uh, that's also why uh, the importance is to uh, hopefully, and I think all panelists have emphasized that, that we connect what's needed in the short run to what's needed in the long run. If we don't do the latter, uh, then we will repeat uh, and fall back into the trap of all the, um, uh, of yeah, repeating the crisis that we have seen uh, before. So um, hopefully we can bring that uh, and help influence uh, those discussions and not just the single meeting uh, next week, but also the follow through uh, on that to make that clear and to push for more multilateralism and, and global cooperation, because um, to repeat it again, uh, food is about life and death. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for, for those uh, last comments. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank one more time our speakers and panelists, Arif, uh, Damayanti, Godfrey, Eugenio, Rob, and Yo for your participation today. Uh, it was uh, very interesting uh, ideas and, and, and comments to go forward. And uh, also to thank all of you for being here uh, with us today and for whoever uh, looks at us uh, um, later on the voyage. So thank you very much. I would like to close this event perfectly on time. So thanks again. Thank you.